but it doesn't make any difference to me anymore. So that's, that's the thing. That's fine. <laughs> okay, ready? Okay, uh, my name is Ed Clendenin. We're at the uh, 2007 annual re reunion of the 376 Bombardment Group. It's September 7th, and we're conducting interviews, and your name is? Pete Kolmanek. And when were you born and where? I was born in Chicago at 2421 Clyburn Avenue, the 3rd of, of July, 1913. 1913. Yes, sir. And uh, what were you doing on December 7th, 1941? I was in, in a bowling alley with my bride and about 10 other couples, and we just got through bowling and sat down to have a beer when the, uh, the bartender there told us to hush. There's something coming up over the radio. Uh-huh. Pearl Harbor attack. So you're all sitting there listening to the radio? So we listened to the radio, yeah, because there's no TV in those days. Well, sure, okay. <laughs> And so, did you run out and enlist, or did no. you think about it, or wait to get drafted, or what? No, the uh, other eight youngsters that were, or no, maybe eight or ten youngsters said they were going to go into the Marines, because we already were at war in Europe, uh -huh. you know, and they were going to go into the Marines or the Navy and be submariners and get extra pay and all that. And another uh, young lad and I, we were both married, we just sat there and listened to them. Uh-huh. As it turned out, in a few months, he and I were the only ones that got in the service. The others never made it until they got drafted, I think. Okay. So you enlisted or you were drafted? Oh, no. That's a, that's a story. See, I was too old to get in. I wanted to get in the Air Corps. Okay. And I was too old to get in. I was about 28 years old, and you had to be 26 or less. You were too old. Oh, okay. I was too old to get in the Air Corps. Okay. And I was married. I had a six-year-old, five-year-old daughter at the time. Uh-huh. I had a defense job at an international harvester company. Uh -huh. I never finished high school, and uh, I had uh, whatever else was, you know, the criteria there. So basically, for all kinds of reasons, they weren't going to take you into the five service. I think it was five reasons. That they okay. Take me. So how did you get into the service then? Well, my brother was a Marine paratrooper. He was missing in action for about five months. We didn't know where he was. Uh huh. So I asked my mother to let me take his birth certificate uh -huh. just to look at it. Yes. And I went downtown, and I got a, a schedule to take the test on, with his birth certificate. That took the test with 22 Chicago University sophomores. So you had to have two years college there uh -huh. also. And I, I took it from there. So when, when was this? In in uh, the spring of forty two, about a month and a half, two months after spring of forty two, yeah. and so I assume that you passed the exam well, or whatever. Well, we went it was. into this place with twenty two University of uh, Chicago sophomores, and after about two hours, uh, they let us out of there, and uh, they told us to wait till we got the results, and about. Maybe half hour or so, a sergeant come out and called three names, and one was my, I was one of them. Uh huh. And my heart was down here. Yes. Then he told the most beautiful words in the world. He said, "Rich, do you go home?" So you were in. Huh? I was two, two of the students and I were in. And so what happened then? Well, then I had to uh, get from three A to one A. And. Uh, I had to tell my bride, I had to quit my job and told my bride that I was laid off because she didn't believe me because I had a lifetime job at an international harvester. And uh, I, I just went, I had went down to the draft board and told them that uh, I was getting in the Air Corps. Uh -huh. I didn't know yet whether I was or not, but right. I had passed the test. And the, the guy told me, he said, you go home. He says, you're married, you got a five-year-old daughter and everything else. And uh, so I came back the following Monday, and I told the guy, I said, you might as well make me one day. I said, I'm going into the service Monday. Uh, that was on a Friday. I said, I'm going to service Monday. Uh huh. And he said, you dumb kid, and changed it to a one A. I take it from what you're saying, your wife wasn't particularly enamored with you going into the service? Not, not just then, but I told her that I was going to be drafted anyway. Uh -huh. They weren't drafted married men with children at the time, especially. I was, <laughs> I was ready to go to 
uh, Washington, D.C. to a Navy facility to learn the torpedo. Mm -hmm. but we were gonna, I was going to get a department there to build torpedoes for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And I was a solid 3A individual yeah. until I went to my boss at the National Harvester Company and told him that I was getting into service anyway. Okay. So he kind of wrote me off. <clears throat> okay. So you, they made you 1A and you passed and you were now in the Army Air Corps. And so then what, where'd they send you, or where did you? I went down to Kelly Field and went through the uh, psycho motor test, or whatever the hell they call them, you know, uh -huh. where they give you the stay nines. You remember, you know, remember the stay nines? No, what's that? It's a category for pilots, navigators, and bombardiers. Okay. According to, to how you test out, they put you in the category. And I didn't know then that I had uh, hacked all three stay nines, the nine stay nines, you see. So you could have been a, could have been any of the yeah, but you get you see my choice was pilot. I didn't want to be anything else. So did, so did you become a pilot? I was a pilot until I busted both eardrums when I was almost through pilot training. I had a cold and I was out solo uh, when, when after making my time. Uh huh. And we were advised not to do two turn spins. The only the instructors could do that. Yes. So I decided to do one, and I come out too fast, and both ears went. So what happened then? I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> well, obviously you didn't. <laughs> okay. So what was option B? <laughs> anyway, no, I was out. You either go go out, or you go to Wichita, Texas, to become a maintenance man. Okay. Anyway, this captain that flew with me on my final ride, I didn't know it was my final ride, but he gave me instructions on the ground because I couldn't hear. Yes. And I took over the first 30 minutes, and he took over the next 30 minutes in a, in a BT-13, BT uh -huh. multi vibrator. And we landed, he talked to me, you know, and he, he talked to my squadron commander. He said, uh, this cadet can fly as good as I can. You know, that's debatable, of course. That's what he told him. The squadron commander told him, not not within my earshot, though, that he should take me out in the next flight and fail me, because they had no room in the back, uh -huh. you know, next class for any any uh, cadets yeah. to join him. So he, he set me up about two days later. He talked to me before the flight, and he said that he's supposed to take me up there for my final flight, uh -huh. and I was going to auger us both in. But he's such a nice guy, I didn't do it, but I flew my 30, 30 minutes, and then he flew 30 minutes, and we come back, and he talked to me for about an hour, you know, trying to get me cooled down. And mm -hmm. I, I was feeling real bad. Anyway, two days later, we met the board, the flying evaluation board. There was a, 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 a light colonel, a major, and a captain there, and a flight surgeon come in, and he told the board there that I couldn't fly higher than 1,000 feet for the Army. Mm -hmm. And I was dead. Mm -hmm. And his captain told the board, you know, when the flight surgeon got through, he said, this cadet could fly as good as he could. Mm -hmm. And that he wanted me to go to get my ears taken care of and stay in the cadet program. Mm -hmm. So I went down to Ellington. Oh, I thanked him. You know, I thanked the board, thanked yeah. him. So I went down to Ellington Field, spent a couple months down there getting my ears taken care of. In the meantime, I stayed in the cadet program as a navigator and a bombardier. Okay. In the various cadet class. I was in 42K, 43A, 43, 4, 5, 6, and I graduated with 43, 7. Okay. As a bombardier. So Thank they, you, Lord. So you went from being a pilot to being a bombardier. The best choice I could ever made, and it, it was a tragedy getting me there because after the war, there was thousands of pilots getting riffed, the reduction in force, because right. I had no room for them. Right. And several of them committed suicide there at Carswell Air Force Base really? because of that. They were either went home or went to Wichita to be maintenance people. Uh -huh. But the B-36 program was coming in. And they, oh, well, first of all, I was sent to Schnoot Field to wait for pilot school to get, get my wing yeah. at Schnoot Field, Illinois. And while there, my uh, commander, Major Cash, kept tearing up my assignment when it came in because I was uh, running the transportation uh, outfit and saving the government millions of dollars just by using common ordinary uh, yeah. sense. So he didn't want to get rid of you. He didn't want to get rid of me. Okay. And one day I called up there after I was there about six months. I said, where the hell are my orders? 
And they get beside you, and they say, well, I'll tell you, sir, if you don't you know, mention my name. He said, uh, the major has been tearing up your assignment because of the job you're doing down there in motor transportation. See, I took two convoys, one to Omaha, Nebraska, and one up to Illinois with, with about 30 or 40 uh, obsolete vehicles. Uh -huh. And I reassigned uh, my drivers. I took all the black men because they were not allowed to drive ambulances or staff cars. Uh -huh. And they were just doing whatever they pleased. Right. So I lined them, I gave them, a, I, I gave them a choice of trucks. They took two and a half ton trucks, and I set them aside. I gave them their own truck master and everything else. Yeah. And uh, uh, they, they were quite happy at that because there was a regulation that, uh, because of a rape case, I think, that the, uh, the black American soldiers couldn't drive staff cars or ambulances. Really. So. Okay. It was quite happy, and because of all this, this major cash kept tearing up my damn orders. So here you are completing Bombardier School, and well, the B the B thirty six program come in. See, oh, okay. And they needed four observers, like navigator, bombardier, uh, aircraft observer, and whatever else, mm -hmm. in each B thirty six at the time, because we were flying forty two hours, thirty eight to forty two hours. We we're picking up airplanes from the factory, consolidated factory. Oh, so this is after the war? After the war, Okay, yeah. okay. Well, all this was after the war. Okay. Because it was at, when, I, when I recovered from my experiences as a, as a guest of the Gestapo, I, I was sent back to Mather to uh, train Chinese and French cadets in the art of bombing. Uh-huh. And that's why I was getting assigned to pilot training, so I had to go to Schlute Field in order to wait for an assignment. You see. Okay. So you said you were a guest of the Gestapo. Going back, how did you get from being a pilot candidate to being a guest of the Gestapo? Well, Obviously, I'm, you were in the 376, <laughs> somewhere in that. That's area. right. I, I joined them uh, down in Peterville in, in uh, North Africa. You joined the 376 when they were in yes, the Spotterville? Okay, and I Peterville. was in the 512 squadron where they sent all the Yugoslav flyers because I knew the Montenegro language. See. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you could talk with the Yugoslav I, people? I, I mean, uh, contingent? Fluently, yeah. Did you fly with them? I flew uh, uh, one mission with each one of them and, and two missions with two of them. I flew six missions, and there's no record of this in my files because my name was similar to theirs. And when we got through, I didn't realize this. My name never got on my uh, flight certificate under my name with the 376 bomb, bomb wing. Really? Or bomb group. It stayed with the Yugoslav Oil Air Force. Huh. See, I don't, I don't have credit for that okay. to this day, but I got shot down on my 13th mission. And that was the Vincenze mission, is that yes, right? Sir. Okay, so you had flown six missions with the Yugoslav yes, attachment and then. My sixth, my seventh is when I got shot down because I flew another mission. See, I was supposed to go uh, to another group with this, with the, uh, the bomb site, the electric bomb site, and I told them I would go if my whole crew would go because uh -huh. I was the only one checked out at that, that new electric bomb site. Was this the Norton or the Sperry? The Sperry. The Sperry. Yeah. Okay. Were they were using the Sperry or the Norton in the 24? They were using the Norton in the 24, but there's another group coming in with the Sperry bomb site. Oh, okay. And because I had a few missions on me, they wanted me to lead the new group coming in. Oh, okay. But I told them I would do it if my whole crew would go with me, and they wouldn't allow that, so I stayed with the 376 bomb group. Was the other group like the 449th or the I don't 450? know which one it was. You don't know? Really. No, okay. I don't know. So anyway, so you joined... The 376 where they were in Fatoville, flew with the Yugoslav, mm -hmm. um, moved up to Sandpan, I believe. When, yeah, when they capitulated, we, we moved over there, and uh, they almost had a tragedy with Skakic's crew, I guess, when they got over to uh, uh, San Picrazio, They lost all track of how to, uh, how, I think they had cloud covers uh -huh. or something, and they couldn't understand the darn, uh, the tow tower or whatever? The, the, the tower, yeah, because they were American. Yeah. And he forgot, they, they forget their uh, American words when they get in any kind of a problem. And here I am back in Africa. Yes. So anyway, they, they, they all made it okay. Fortunately, they landed, yes. They landed okay. Okay. 
when the uh, I've heard other other Americans who flew, substituted once in a while with the Yugoslav crew, and they said they talked English unless it got exciting, that's like fighters, and then all of a sudden they all started talking that, that's Yugoslav right. or whatever. That that was that was my observation. Uh -huh. And he said it's it's interesting to be on an airplane in which you can't understand what anybody is saying. That's right. You know, Yugos the, the Montenegrin language is pretty difficult. Well, it's I should say Yugoslav because they weren't all Montenegrins. Uh -huh. Montenegrins came from from the little country of Montenegro, they had some Serbs there, and, uh -huh. and, mo and a lot of these guys flew ME-109s before, it, before uh, King Peter got them out of there into Cairo, mm -hmm. where he got together with President Roosevelt to get them assigned back to the States here and go to school and, and form crews. For, form crews, okay. Yeah. So you were on the Vincenze mission. Yes. Tell me about the Vincenze mission. Is there anything to I understand the 512th lost all their planes on that mission. We were the first ones to get hit. We should have never gone in there because when we were we aborted either day, two days or the day before because of weather. Uh huh. So when we got up this one morning, it told us take off, same thing, same everything, no deep, no briefing, just to uh, fly our mission. They forgot to tell the the uh, Tuskegee flyers that we were airborne. Because you were supposed to rendezvous with the 98. Yes, the rendezvous with us. And all those spies they had around those, uh, around, the, you know, whatever air bases we had, they got word to all the German air bases, the fighters, that we were out there alone without any fighter cover. So they massed about 150, let's say from 100 to 150 fighters. We don't know because there's only one that bothered us, the one that shot us down. Shot you down? But I forgave him a long time ago because that was his job. So there you are, 17 planes jumped by 100 plus fighters. Well, you don't know. They came in uh, four. More than, you, more than you could count. They came in four at a time. And we were the first ones hit. And uh, we were the tail end Charlies. OK. You were tail end. Your plane was tail end at the rear. Tail end Charlies, supposed to be. And the uh, tail gunner, Sergeant Porteous, first one got hit. And he was a substitute tail gunner. I've got to tell you a story about that later. OK. And they knocked out uh, the number three engine, and they, they must have got a some something. I don't know was whether it was lobbing uh, some kind of material into a bomb base. Uh huh. And uh, it, I think it was a FW one eighty. It had some kind of torpedo. We weren't aware of it at the time. Hmm. I take it they hit you before you got to your target. Yes, sir. So basically, then you bailed out. Well, there's a story before that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was still calling out fighters. Now you were up in the nose. I, I, was, in the, I was in the nose because fortunately this time I had a nose gun. And normally I'm in there because the navigator was claustrophobic. He wouldn't get that tail gun, that uh, nose position. Okay. So we had Sergeant Yavorsky, Yavorsky in there. And he was up in the nose. He was in the nose. Okay. See, you can get in the nose, but you can't get out by yourself. Oh, okay. And I've got frozen hands to prove that. Okay. I don't have any fingerprints because of my navigator. Okay. Anyway, when we first, the first pass we got hit, I let the navigator went out and the radio operator went out. Out of the airplane? Out of the airplane. Okay. Like right now. There was okay. no, no bailout alarm or anything. They, they went out. They just left. And the navigator's job was a, that nose turret. Uh-huh. Anyway, I was calling out fighters, and I looked up the rudder pedals, no pilots. There was no pilot or co-pilot? No, no, no pilot. They, they left, and the pilot never rang the alarm bell. And here I am still calling out fighters for our gunners out there, you know, they're coming in. And no response. So I looked up. That's when I told, you know, Sergeant Yavorsky, and I pulled uh, uh, Sergeant w uh, uh, Wisman's, uh, I pulled him on his uh, uh -huh. flight suit. You know, some, let's get out of here. He was still firing, even though his top turret was shot out, was shot off. He was firing into the wind, and he got a fighter, I think. Wiseman. 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 Yeah. Okay. He was up in the top turret. He was no. Yeah, he was running. The, that was his job. He was the engineer, but he was running the top, top turret. turret. So basically, at this point, there's only three of you left in the plane. Three of us left in the plane. And uh, I, you know, I went like this because, and I didn't realize that when I let Sergeant Yavorsky out of the nose turret, he stepped on my oxygen hose. 
uh -huh. and I was off of oxygen at altitude, and I didn't realize this, and I was slowly blacking out. Blacking out, and that's when I decided, you know, I got my uh, my chest pack. I was trying to put it on, and my the, the hooks were underneath my flag suit. Yes. And Yavorsky came over, he pulled it, and dropped his flag suit, and he helped me with my chest pack. And that's when I went down to the navigator's uh, escape hatch under his table. Uh huh. And I pulled up, it's frozen. And the good Lord helped me yank up, and that blast of air, air hit me. The last thing I remember, Sergeant Yavorsky hit me on the shoulder, like, you know, good luck. And I, as I was going out, I heard my first wife calling me, my, well, my wife at the yeah. time, Pete. Pete, about eight times, just like you and I are talking here. And just as I hit the blast of air, I passed out, and the good Lord opened my chute. I found myself floating about maybe eight or 10,000 feet with my oxygen mask still on. And I tore it off, and I saw two fighters, like, you know, waving their wings, like, hey, buddy, good luck. But we were told before, in sometime in December or, or in November, that they were shooting down our airmen in their parachutes. Were these German so fighters waggling their wings at you? They're like, you know, good luck, buddy, you know. So they weren't going to shoot you? No, out of the... no. That was a false, they, had, they were kind of chivalrous, you know. Okay. So did the three of you then get out of the plane? I don't know about the other, well, Larry, Larry did, because I met him uh -huh. at one reunion when he came in with his, uh, with his bride, his okay. second bride, I think, in a wheelchair. Okay. And the other one, they, our gunner saw him on the ground, but they, he, he never got back into uh, Air Force. Okay. Or, so anyway, so you're out of the plane and you're floating down. I assume you landed in, in Italy somewhere? You didn't land in, or you landed well, in the I, water? I, 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 wanted, I, I was heading for a village, you know, about 3,000 feet. Yet, and I tried, like I told us, tried to get that chute uh, to turn a little bit. Uh -huh. But this hand I found out then it was useless because I, I got hit. And because I was losing oxygen, you know, and, Upstairs, I didn't feel it as much. It was all bloody. So with this left hand, I tried to slip that chute. And I almost collapsed it. So I just let it go. And I run up in this village with my in the village house with my chute on the chimney. Fortunately, the shroud lines were long enough where I hit the courtyard first, and I rolled up against the house feet first. Uh huh. So either way, I'd, if the shroud lines were a little shorter or the chimney was higher, I'd have got dashed into it. If I'd have got hit head first, I'd have died. Wow. Yeah, that's how the good Lord works. And, and then uh, my sh I tried to get my shoot out, and some woman come out screaming. I got a little picture of that that I drew, and I was, I guess, it was Gestapo. And uh, I tried to tell her, you know, get someone to get my shoot down. So okay. a little lad, a young lad came out, and he got a ladder, he took the shoot down. And I gave him my, my skate E&E e &E kit you know, uh -huh. for, for that. And, uh, so he cut, up, cut the shroud line? No, he brought it down. Oh, he brought it down. Yeah, he okay. brought it down. Okay. And uh, my arm was ble bleeding profusely, and someone cut a piece of that parachute off and wrapped it up for me. So had you been wounded in the fighter attack? Or yes. Were you hit, or were you no. hit coming no, no, out of the, the fighter out, attack? Well, fighter I was still attack. up there, but see, losing consciousness, I, I didn't notice it as much. Okay. See, it, I, so anyway, so you, you landed in this village, and the guy, put, the little kid pulls the chute off, so then what happened? A couple of padres come by. And uh, they put me in, in what was some kind of a grocery cart, I guess. You know, I had a side door. Uh -huh. Just as I was in there, a couple, a, a cabinary, tall cabinary, uh, Italian soldier with, uh -huh. a, with, a, with a little a pistol. Okay. And a little German with a long oh, rifle. With a big pistol, so, okay. <laughs> yeah. And they said, got me out of there because they were executing uh, down airmen during that time. They were. Oh yeah, the, the the farmer there was pitch pitchforking him to death. That was, we heard that uh, radio broadcast by uh, Himmler or Herring or some, one of those guys that take a, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So we lost a lot of airmen because of that. Really? You never hear about this. So were you afraid they were going to pitchfork you? To well, I'd, uh, <laughs> of course. Of course, okay. Yeah, and uh, the, these uh, two, that Italian and, and German soldiers. Had got me out of that truck, and I don't know what they were doing. They just then two boat wife officers come by, yes, in an open vehicle of some kind, yes. So when they saw what was going on, and my arm was, you know, they saw all that blood on it, 
they told me, they told these two soldiers that they would take over. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> they, I, I sat behind them on the rum on this, uh, on that tonneau, whatever the hell I called it. You know? Uh huh. And they took off about sixty miles an hour somewhere. I don't know where the hell it was. Took me to a hospital, and uh, they dropped me off. You know. Got and all I could do them. is salute them left hand. I thank them in, in my own language. And I went into this hospital <clears throat> room, and there was a German there that uh, <clears throat> saw my my ring and my wristwatch, and he wanted it real bad. And my goddamn arm. He wanted your ring and your wristwatch? Yeah. And he tried to grab it, but the, there was a boulevard, and it had a clasp there that he had to know how to open the damn thing. And I started hollering for a, screaming for a Hoffman, you know. Yeah. So he kind of slapped me and then backed off. And I went back, sat down, and I dozed off a little bit. And about, I don't know how long later, I saw the Luger on the counter and his rifle close by. And he was back there making believe he was sleeping. Making believe? That he was sleeping, yeah. Yes. So he wanted me to go for that Luger so he could shoot me and get my value. Ah, okay. I knew better. Anyway, a doctor come by shortly after and uh, looked at my arm and got a pair of pliers or some damn thing. And he hanged it out. No, when he threw it in that metal bucket, I could hear the sound uh -huh. and I had didn't have the sense to retrieve that damn thing for a souvenir. I still feel bad about that. Okay. Anyway, it took me from there, it took me to Frankfurt on the Main. Ever hear of, of Dulag? No. That's where they're executing bombardiers and Jewish American flag officers, the interrogation center. Frankfurt on the Main. It's right across from the Farben, the dye works. Yeah. And I was in a place like a doghouse here. So the Germans were executing Jewish bombardiers? Flyers? You know, bombardiers and Jewish American flying officers. You, you'll never hear about this. Okay. No, I had not heard that. No, because they squelched that when they when they took over the country. You know, our people. Uh huh. So that is, I, you, Gestapo. So I assume you ended up in a Luft, Luftstallag or something. Well, <clears throat> after about I don't know. I was there. I don't know how many days. I was, days or nights I was there. It was a it was a a. a, a Jewish American captain that was next to me. When he got to, you know, we got talking to know that we he wasn't a ferret. He told me that if he doesn't come out to tell his family what had happened to him, see. Uh huh. And uh, they, they took me out like twice a day to interrogate me. And and this young, I don't know what he was. I think it was a Hoffman. He had better control of the American language, English language than I did. He came. I think he came from Oxford or some damn place. You know. He was interrogated me. I gave him my name, rank, and serial number for about the hundredth time, and he got exasperated and hit me on the mouth with the back of his, of his uh, hand. And I was fortunate enough that I didn't respond in kind. Out of you know, Geneva Convention doesn't allow that. Right. He knocked my teeth not out but in. Yeah. You know where uh, they were loose, but all bloody, and I couldn't talk. Thank you, Lord. So. They let me go, and I joined the rest of them, and one up at Stalag looked one. Did you end up then re re reuniting with the rest of the crew? Well, yes. Well, so, uh, some of them. Some of them. We we went through this one. They, they marched us out after maybe a day or two later. Marched us out through an underground. Uh, I think it must might have been a, a train station or some damn thing where mm -hmm. it was during an air raid, and all these Germans were in there. Mm -hmm. and they're about. Forty of us, I guess, being marched out with two guards mm -hmm. through there, and someone they saw us. There was a who and a cry. They come, come rushing at us with umbrellas and canes or whatever else, you know. I heard that some of the civilians attacked downed American flyers. Oh yes, yes, and uh, we had a couple. One, one had his head bandaged, and uh, one we, we almost had to carry the guy. And I had my arm in a, mm -hmm. in a sling. But we watered them off, and we ran down toward, towards a little opening where the things like a like a uh, where the trains would be going through. Mm -hmm. And uh, they walked us down in a narrow passageway with one rail. Right. And I was just praying that good Lord that the train didn't come by there. And we finally got to an opening, and we got to uh, the forty and eights. You know, what's Maybe 50, 60 of us in 48.
Uh -huh. And it took us, uh, we wound up in Berlin for about two days and two nights during the air raids. You know, the, the, the British bombed by night and the right. Americans by day. Right. And uh, one fear I had that one of those bombers or fighters would crash into that boxcar we were in. So when did you finally arrive at the POW camp that you were going to be Some, guest sometime of? In, sometime in January. Of 44? 44. So I, I don't know because they had no calendar. Okay. Or so somewhere in January, February, 44. Yeah, days and nights kept coming together because okay. you had short days up there, you know. And were you at that one particular camp for the duration? Yes, for the rest of the time. When were you liberated? Well, the 28th of April, 45 is when the... We, we, Usually, made, we'll call it 6 o'clock in the morning, call it a pal. Uh -huh. And uh, it was about 6.30, and no guards came by. So someone opened the little opening they had up, up above the windows uh -huh. and saw no one in the guard in the tower. So let them open the window and went around and opened the door for us. We went out there like yelling like crazy. You know. So with the first thing we did was take that Nazi flag down. We had a flag made out of scrap. Uh -huh. material. We hauled that up. Were there only Americans in this camp? or were No, there no, the Americans. They were British, British? and uh, they were, uh, the Russians were not under Geneva Convention, so they were uh, apart from us. But they had uh, French and you know, South African. So was the camp liberated by Americans? Both. Both? Americans, the Americans from the West and the Russians from the East. Okay. And uh, the, the guards left you know, some of them, their families couldn't make it. We found, we, we found atrocities that you wouldn't believe. The, the, the Germans finally, the German uh, soldiers finally killed their family and shot them in the head so the, German, so the Russians wouldn't rape them. They tried to make their way over to Sweden or Finland, whatever. We thought at first that the Russians were doing this, but the American, the, the German husbands were doing this. So the Germans were... Husbands were killing their own families. That's right, because they got raped. The, the, the women in that area had brought their daughters to the front of our gate, screaming for us to take them in, you know, so the Russians wouldn't get to them. Huh. Because if you know the Battle of Stalingrad, the scorched earth policy that the Germans committed, going right. in and coming back out. out again. Yes. And these uh, Russian soldiers, a lot of them were Mongolians, you know. They'd come from the far north. Uh-huh. They're big and... and no education or anything else. And anything that looked German, they killed, unless they could rape it. Did they treat, you, did they treat the American and British prisoners okay? Well, they, they didn't have anything to do with us. They, oh, they, okay. they, couldn't, they couldn't get in. I, I, I made uh, friends with one Russian that come in. I, I ran the mess hall, by the way. Oh, at the, at the POW camp? Yeah, okay. because I had, uh, when I was a youngster, I was in a CCC camp, like, you know, after I left the... Uh -huh. the Cavalry, and I ran the mess hall for about three months when a couple of my hillbilly friends got. In. Anyway, I knew how to put together. We were just feeding our block about right. 200 men, you see. Okay. So I took it over. Uh, one Russian come in uh, and uh, with his, with his uh, one of his uh, soldiers, and. Uh, I hollered to him, I said, Kakos, you brought you, how are you, brother? And when he saw that, he looked at me, and he come over, he picked me up, I was about 90-some pounds then, he picked me up, you know, and, and uh, hugged me, took out a bottle of vodka, huh. and offered it to me, well, you know, I made believe I had some, you know. So it sounds like you speak a lot of languages. No, just, uh, just, I, I, I studied French when I was there in, in Germany, uh -huh. and I studied, uh, I got, Studied Russia, Russian when I was a kid for a cookie. We had a two-hour session in an abandoned grocery store here in Chicago. Uh huh. And for that cookie, I learned how to speak, speak Russian, Russian because it was similar to Montenegro. It's not, you know. Because you said earlier you could talk to the Yugoslav. Yeah, well, I, yeah, so I, I know it quite well. Huh. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I, I gave him this this uh, D bar and some cigarettes, you know, and. And he said, check, I mean, wait. And he went out with his group. Next day, he come in with 10 halves of registered pork and lamb of some kind. Yes. Remember? And he put the last one, greasy one, in my arm. You know, I had a wrap uniform on one of those woolly things, you know. Anyway, I thanked him. 
and give him some more D bars and uh, some more cigarettes. And again, he said, check guy. Two days later, he come in and got me by the hand. He took me out. He had brought in about, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 heads of uh, cattle there. I couldn't count because our, our Kriegis were making fires of smoke and flies and every damn thing else, you know, in, 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 in our, 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 uh, our uh, camp area there where uh -huh. we used to have roll call. Uh -huh. And I looked at one of the kidneys, and I knew about this when I was five years old, about the kidneys, and they were kind of spotted. So I told the guys, that just to, just wait. So I took one to our British doctor. Yes. And he come out and told these guys to make sure they cooked the food real well because it was... It was kind of spotty. Okay. But it was a mess. So did you I slaughter the, the cattle? They, they, I didn't know. No, no. We had, we had an ox hanging in, in, the, in the freezer compartment without any, any uh, power for about maybe a month. And it was kind of moldy. So okay, kind of I, ripe, yeah. I got some vinegar. I knew about that. I got some vinegar, and we cleaned it off, you know, and scraped off all that crud. Uh-huh. And... Uh, we cooked it for the guys that were doing the guard, the guard duty in my in my my barrack, and they saved me a part of the of the better stuff for that, and I couldn't eat it. I remember breaking down. Huh. I couldn't chew it. I was up for about six days and six nights, hmm. and I take uh, Major Beer's bicycle out on the little island there, try to get myself you know back where I could go to sleep, and finally on about the sixth or seventh, I don't know which it was, about. They told me later, it took about eight of them to get me down in the bed, and I slept for 18 hours. Hmm. I didn't know what was going on for 18 hours. Now, while you were in, a, in the POW camp, I assume your wife was told that you were missing in action? For the first six months, I understand, yeah. And then I got the letters later that I was missing in action for six months, and they told them I was a guest of the Gestapo or something. Were you able to write to her? Was she able to write to you? She was able to write to me about, you know, but they censored everything. Okay. I found some of those letters that I had written that this was blacked out. You know. Okay. And I still have them somewhere at home. Obviously, she was relieved that you were alive. But <laughs> oh, yeah. and what did your daughter? Th was, she, was she too young to? Or what well, did she, she was. She was seven about the time I got home. Oh, okay. Yeah. That that was a reunion you wouldn't believe. I could imagine. So you were. Liber your camp was liberated at the end of April. What? How long did it take for you to get home? Uh, I got home, I think, uh, late in May sometime, because we had to go to, because we were the last ones out of uh, Stalag Luft 1, okay. you know, my group. And uh, we got on the B-17, and they took us over Berlin on, on the way back, uh -huh. twice, twice around Berlin. And there's no words to describe the devastation there. I would imagine it was bombed all the crazy, all the... Day and, day and night for, I don't know how many weeks, it, uh, you know, every, everything was just scraggly there. Anyway, huh. we wound up at, uh, at uh, Camp Lucky Strike. Where's, where was Camp Lucky Strike? In La Harve, France. La Harve, okay. That's a, that's a point where they get all these uh, Kriegis through there and get them a shower and everything, get them clothes. And, and uh, one bad thing is they, they told us to, to eat sparingly what they what they give us the first time. Well, a lot of our guys, I saw some of our guys going through several times. One guy, after all that stuff, he, he got 12 uh, donuts, and he, he, he died. Yeah, you aren't supposed to feed, I mean. No, another guy took a Red Cross pasta, a whole one, and he baked it, you know, mixed all it and baked it while we're still in Stalag Luft 1, and he died. It's just stupid. Right. I, 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 I just abided by what they told us. So did you go home by boat? Once you got to the harbor, fly or what did they no, do? No, we went home by boat. And I steered, it was a Liberty, the Marine Dragon, Liberty ship. Uh -huh. And I got to know, I was fortunate enough to be on the top deck. Uh -huh. The rest of my buddies were down there at seven tiers, I think. Uh -huh. the, the, the stench down there. And uh, I got to, to know the captain. He wanted to know about experiences, you know, and we talked. He talked about himself. He let me steer that ship 270 degrees during the night, you know. I spent many, huh. many hours doing that. But we still had submarine uh, uh, problems. Really? After there's, the war? There, yeah, there were submariners that uh, didn't... Didn't, uh, didn't surrender? Didn't surrender, yeah. So we had 
some kind of destroyers all around us. Remember when we saw the Liberty, Statue of Liberty, for the first time, you know. So you docked in New York City? Somewhere there, yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. I don't know, and I, I didn't care. All I wanted to go was get home. <laughs> I, I assume they gave you a 30 day, some pass to go home and see the family. Well, they gave, I went up in Fort Sheridan with Italian carbine and a blanket. Uh huh. And everything I gave away, you know, up, up to that point. And some sergeant there at Fort Sheridan lamented the fact that he never got overseas to get a souvenir, so I gave him the carbine. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I got to tell you this, how I got home a couple of months earlier, I, we were head, I got a Jeep from some guy for, you know, for a couple of days, and I had three at Kriegis with me. We were heading for Paris. So we got out of there, and we come to a fork in the road or, or something in, in this, just beyond the harbor. We asked this one woman, you know, which way to go to Paris. And she says, you Americans better go home. She says, all these women are sick, malad, you know, they're sick from diseases, from both the, you know, the armies coming through there, and all these women had uh, sex with these guys. And she says, you saved us? She says, now you go home. Well, these other three guys kept on going. I took the Jeep and went back home. Yeah. No, but the two went back, back to, to, to the Camp heart. Lucky Strike, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Next day I got there, the commander called me in. He said, uh, the two guys that had a packet of 500 uh, staff sergeants, you know, packet, uh, they had them in packets. Uh -huh. And uh, the two lieutenants that were there took off, you know. And they had no one to get their, their uh, ration or anything. So he asked me if I would do it. He said, you can go home with them. So I took over and he gave me a young lieutenant to work with me. Uh huh. So that got me home a couple of months earlier. A couple of months earlier. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you were talking about getting your the DFC for your gunners. Tell me about that. Okay, I got to tell you this. The reason the you know, senator asked me, I had several senators working on this, and they asked me, so why didn't you take up this up sooner? Yes. Well, I told them, first of all, I never got discharged from, from uh, Fort Sheridan when I was a private there, simonizing mules' asses, making $16 a month. My dad got me in there, I was about 16 or 17, and gave me out the gang I was in, under an assumed name and age. Uh -huh. Well, several months later, my, my commander, whatever the hell he was, called me in, he, he told me, he says, uh, I'm there under false pretenses. But he mentioned something about courts martial. I couldn't even spell courts martial. You know? So the next morning I took off with my possessions, whatever I had on me, I took off on a freight train and went up in the Ozarks for a while. Then I, I went out on the road for a couple years, you know, riding the rails. Never got discharged. I take, take it this was before Pearl Harbor. Oh, yes, okay. well before okay. Pearl yeah. Harbor. Okay. Before I even, you know, before I even uh, loped my first bride in 1936. Okay. And the other thing was this birth certificate of my brother's, you see. Yes. And if they'd have found that out, I figured <laughs> they'd probably take my retirement away. So I, I, see. I don't worry about it anymore. I, I gave see. it back to them last year. Okay. So because you use your brother's birth certificate to get in, that's when they were claiming you and you had falsified your No, 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 that was long no, that was the, the, the the cavalry was long before all this happened. Oh, okay. See, cavalry okay, okay. I was an assumed name and age. Okay. Instead of K, it was a C. Okay. O M I C H. I see. see. So technically, you were still in the cavalry. Still am. Still am. Yeah. Okay. But uh, so you've been A W L all this whole time. <laughs> well, you, you can say that. But we well, got to. Okay. Sixteen. What sixteen dollars a month? You know. Right. And keep. But my brother's birth certificate, that was the big thing because... That was uh, to get you in after Pearl Harbor. Yes, that was yeah. to get me in, in the Air Corps. Okay. See, I, 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 I could have gotten in uh, at my age and doing anything, you know, but I wanted to fly. And, wanted and to, fly. to be a cadet, you had to be under 26. Okay. So I gave it back to him last year, okay. his birth certificate. So he's got... But he didn't even know I gave it, but he's got... He's, he's doesn't quite have Alzheimer's, but he's two years younger than me, but... He, He's, uh, he didn't remember I brought it back to him on his 90th birthday hmm. about two years ago. Okay. Did your brother serve in the 
He was a Marine paratrooper, jumping out of good airplanes. Okay. That's why he was missing in action. He was leading some tanks at the time, you know, and they lost their radio, whatever, uh -huh. and he was, he had his baton, he was, you know, you know, tapping which way they should go, and either Iwo Jima or Okinawa, and he got hit pretty bad, and he was in a body bag. He was a, in a in body a corridor, bag? Yeah, in a yeah. corridor. Someone happened to notice that there was a movement there. So and they thought he was dead? They thought he was dead, yeah. Was, anyway, he got the Navy Cross and all that stuff, wow. but he got the citation. You see, now I got the Navy Cross, uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, DFC, DFC, but no citation for that one mission on the fifteenth of December. Have I got time to talk about it? Well, we're going we're we're getting close out of time. If you okay, by golly, yes. So uh, anyway, well, I I came here with also to see my old buddies, but to get the citations for my gunners. I don't care about the rest of the crew. Okay. Well, I got the DFC from a general after I got home, but no citation. So you could buy a damn DFC in a pawn, pawn shop, shop today. So okay. I don't know how I'm going to get I'm going to talk to these people. See, what had happened soon after uh, we got shot down on, on the 28th, right. all our records of that mission were destroyed because it was embarrassing to the, uh, one of the commanders that was on that lead aircraft. Thompson. It took us to the wrong target. Thompson? Uh, that, no, not Ralph. You talking about Ralph? Yeah. No, no, no. That was, that was on the fifth, on the 28th. Oh, okay. This was one of the group commanders. On the 15th? On the 15th. Okay. And we left the formation in, in enemy territory, mind you. The safety had never, that had never happened before. And we destroyed the brief target. Uh -huh. And I had K-17 cameras for this the diary of a bombardier that was on the 513th on that mission and my navigator's uh, uh, letters. Oh, yeah. And he mentioned there that we must have been young and foolish to leave the formation when he did. Hmm. Okay. And I have all the proof there. Yeah. But when I, when I send it through the channels, I even went to the Pentagon during the Cold War and they wouldn't let me go beyond the foyer because I don't know why. Huh. And some woman come down and took my my folder and all the, the information that said to get back to me. I never did. Never did. Yeah. So. Oh, well. Well, thank you for coming hey, by. It my, was quite, my, quite enjoyable. My pleasure. See, I, I thank the good Lord for all my days, for the rest of my days, for all the good angels I had on my shoulder. See? But well. this shows part of it. Okay. If I can get a copy, may, maybe I'll even leave it here. Wait a second. You've got to take, take your microphone. Oh.